When did you first grow curious about the paranormal? Dare you dig deeper? You are listening to Howls in Asher. And welcome everybody to the House of Asher. I am your host, Steve Asher, and uh, we made it, guys. We're up to episode 100 now. And I just want to say thanks uh, thanks for everybody listening in. Um, you may be listening to us through Para UK, Paranormal UK Radio. Let's try it again. Paranormal UK Radio, if I can get my tongue to work correctly. You also may be hearing us on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, iHeart, SoundCloud, and various other platforms. But wherever you're at, and whenever you're at, welcome to the show. Uh, today... As I mentioned, this is our 100th, epi- 100th episode, and I'm so excited I can't talk right, and that's that's the God's honest truth. Um, growing up as a kid through the 70s and 80s, I was always fascinated by anomalies and curious things, and uh, our next guest is a gentleman who has some of that some of that same draw, because he has actually written a very, very interesting and compelling book. Uh, the author is Mr. Lewis Proud, and the name of the book is Borderland Phenomena, Volume 1, Spontaneous Combustion, Potagistry, and Anomalous Lights. And this is, again, by Lewis Proud, and it is available on Amazon. Lewis, are you there with us, sir? Yes, I'm here. Oh, man. It's good to be on the show. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. And, and like I said, uh, I, I truly am excited about this because it's one of, these, one of those subjects that I've always had a real kind of a, I don't say a morbid curiosity. I, you don't want to say, oh, I'm so excited about, maybe it's the wrong choice of word, I'm drawn to. Uh, yeah, because it's such an odd, it's such an odd thing. Um, let me ask you real quick too. Um, I probably should mention that people can go to Stevie Asher to learn more about different things. I know uh, you had sent me a photo of, uh, I guess it was a case photo where somebody was checking out yeah. a, a person who had died in the uh, died supposedly from spon- spontaneous combustion or or SHC. Mm. And, uh, yeah. and so with your permission, I, I might stick it up there for them to, to kind of see as they're hearing the radio hearing the story and be able to look it up, which in some of this they can look up on Google anyway. But um, but let me ask you, yeah. uh, do you have a website or some way if people want to contact you? Or Obviously, there's the, the book on Amazon, but do you have a, a way if people want to contact you about some cases or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. So I've got a, a, a website or blog, which is uh, louisproud.net. Um, so certainly people can contact me via the website, um, I'm also on Twitter as well, uh, which is um, at Louis Proud too. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And I, I do like hearing from uh, from my readers and, and listeners and everything. I, you know, I, I hear that's how I hear about so many. Um, I hear a lot of interesting stories and cases from people, you know, or people all over the world. So anyone who wants to contact me, feel free. Awesome. I was going to say, and I'll, I'll kind of joke off and on between uh, between these questions because that's just my nature. Um, so, in school, did they call you like King Louis, or did you kind of have like a kind of a nickname with that? Because my name is Stevie, and they always called me Stevie when I was small. So I was just kind of curious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I'm sure I, I I would have probably been called all sorts of names. <laughs> oh, <laughs> same, same. Okay. Well, well let me get yeah. into this. Um, <clears throat> you know. What do you mean by borderland? You use that term yeah. in your title. What is the significance of this term in regards to the paranormal? Yeah, absolutely. So um, basically when I use that term, I'm referring to things that lie on the, the border or edge of this reality. And they're things that are sort of neither here nor there, but somewhere in between. And they occupy a liminal realm. And it's a it's a interesting word uh, liminal it cam- comes from the Latin word limen, meaning threshold. Um, <clears throat> and I'm of the opinion that uh, these paranormal occurrences sort of basically have a sort of other dimensional origin, uh, and we're sort of catching brief glimpses of these things on the the edge of our reality. Um, so sometimes these things will bleed through into our world, um, and I think there's really strong evidence that uh, we do live in a multiverse. Um, Now, I mean, most of those theories suggest that these universes are separate, that they don't interact. Uh, But there are other theories that suggest that they do interact. Uh, And maybe that very sort of interaction 
if you like, gives rise to some of these paranormal occurrences, or rather there are certain times, uh, certain conditions that allow for these things to, as I said, bleed through into our reality. And we just sort of catch very gleep, sorry, very brief glimpses of those things. So, uh, you know, we find that in the case of, of UFOs, for example, and uh, sightings of ghosts, etc., um, and also, you know, in, in cryptozoology as well, some of these strange creatures that are sighted, um, they don't really seem to be sort of based in this reality. They seem to originate from some other reality, um, you know, and uh, and that's why we never really sort of find hard physical evidence for these things. Well, you know, uh, something that I was going to ask you. Now, growing up as a young guy, what mm. is sort of your origin story? What brought you to this? Something had to piqued your interest yeah. in this what 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 is that discovery that you've had or or whatever it was what what pulled you to it toward this type of thing yeah well i i've been writing you know books on the paranormal for a while now um, borderland phenomena is my is my fourth book um, but i started back in my early 20s uh, i wrote a book called um, dark intrusions um, an investigation into the paranormal nature of sleep paralysis experiences and that's because, um, you know, from my late teens uh, up until my sort of uh, early to mid-20s, um, I had quite a few sleep paralysis experiences. Um, and I've, I don't know if you're familiar with that phenomenon. I'm sure you, you probably are. It's, uh, it's something that a lot of people have experienced, of course. It's, it's not that uncommon. Um, but certain people seem to, to have, you know, these experiences more frequently and they can be you know more intense and and, and more terrifying sure. uh, but basically it's a uh, you know it's an altered state of consciousness um it's a, a state between you know being awake and being asleep um and, uh, and you know it's it's essentially a liminal state of consciousness it's um uh, can either be during hypnagogia uh, which is when you're drifting off to sleep, or hypnopompia, uh, which is when you're just emerging from sleep. Uh, but basically, people have all these really bizarre experiences where during sleep paralysis, of course, your body is paralyzed. Um, and, and of course, that's a normal part of, of REM sleep that's to prevent us from acting out our dreams, of course. Right, running into a wall when you're thinking in a marathon or something like that. Yeah, exactly. So there you are. You're, you're basically pinned to the bed. You're, um, you know, you, you really can't move, um, and you feel completely awake and alert. And during that state, you can uh, you can have all sorts of odd experiences where there seems to be a presence in the room. Um, sometimes you'll experience the sensation of being touched. Um, you'll hear voices and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people who have these experiences, they sort of describe it as. Um, you know, it seems to be a type of visitation. I suppose it's 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 um, it's you know, and and, and it's it's linked to, of course, the paranormal in the sense that uh, you know people believe that they're they're encountering a, a spirit or a, a demon or something like that. Um, but right. we certainly be like a, well, I was just going to say like the night hag syndrome. Um, I was going to ask you real quick. Are you familiar hmm. with Brian Sharpless? He's actually a professor here in America who that's sort of his yeah. course of study. Right, okay. I, I must admit I, I have not heard of uh, that man, no. Well, I just started to say I had him on uh, probably, I don't know, about 30 episodes back. And um, yeah. and it's so strange because, like you said, it does affect a lot more people than you would think. And it, it mm. often seems, especially when um, you're in a process, say you're in a process yep. of writing and you're in processes of uh, construction or whatever, it seems like there's so much going on and so much is firing in the synapses of your head that – it's just not going to let you sleep, and it and it is terrifying. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, the the thing is too. I mean, some people can have sleep paralysis episodes that aren't particularly scary. Maybe they're not sort of accompanied by you know these so called hallucinations. Uh, they only really experience the paralysis. Um, I mean, there, there can be a whole range of different things that are experienced in that 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 very strange state of consciousness between. Um, you know, being awake and being asleep, that liminal state, of course. Um, <clears throat> now, in, in my case, uh, I, I had some very terrifying experiences where it more or less seemed like a sort of a form of demonic possession uh, because there seemed to be this, this entity that kept coming back night after night. And it, 
it felt as though it was actually trying to you know invade my uh, my body if you like it uh, it was really really terrifying um and i was also experiencing things like um you know the bed shaking and that sort of thing there seemed to be this entity standing at the foot of the bed uh shaking the bed back and forth uh which was was horrible but um and you know we find that of course in um you know cases where um uh you know <clears throat> cases of haunted houses and that sort of thing a lot of people describe these these sorts of experiences so they'll be in that particular environment which is believed to be haunted and they experience um you know these kind of sleep paralysis type effects uh as well so i really do think that um you know that these experiences aren't just hallucinations i think there's something else going on in certain cases um, i'm not saying that all sleep paralysis experiences um you know are necessarily uh you know the result of entities and that sort of thing whatever they are of course um but certainly there's a there's a crossover there with the paranormal uh that really needs to be acknowledged i think certainly uh let me ask you this uh, getting back to the book a little bit the first <clears> section <throat> of your book deals uh, with the spontaneous human combustion experience yep. or, or again uh, shc what is mm -hmm. for the people who just have never got off and in, got into it or really heard a bunch about it you know because not everybody goes into that into that world what exactly yep. is SHC? Yeah, so spontaneous human combustion is a it's an unexplained phenomenon uh, whereby the human body is almost entirely reduced to ash. It generally occurs within a period of around ten to twelve hours, although it's hard to put a time frame on it. Um, and, um, and and what seems to happen is that the the human body catches fire from within, um, and of course the flesh and bones are consumed by that fire. Um, and generally speaking, to nearby objects are more or less unaffected. So, um, you know, in these cases, uh, you know, the house, for example, isn't isn't burnt to the ground. Um, in some cases, there can be objects just very close by that are, you know, stacks of paper and that sort of thing that are more or less unscorched. Um, so it's a very baffling phenomenon. Um, <clears throat> the thing that's really baffling about it, of course, is that it is very difficult to to reduce a human body to ash um you know i mean if we look at uh, what takes place in a in a modern crematorium they use fuels like oil and gas and so on to and you know they they burn those fuels in the presence of, of forced air to try and raise the temperature so we're talking about a very high temperature it's around sort of a thousand degrees celsius and that's to you know vaporize and oxidize the body uh, generally takes between 90 minutes and two hours for that to occur and even then you have um you know quite noticeable uh fragments of bone still remaining uh, but in the case of shc we sometimes see that the human but that the bones themselves have actually been reduced to as i said a very fine powder um but you know in a crematorium they actually crush those those bone fragments using a machine called a cremulator right um so you know we're talking about a, a you know a lot of energy that needs to be used in order to reduce the body to that state um so the the mystery really is where does that energy come from and you know um by what process is that achieved um so shc is just such a such a baffling phenomenon such a, a huge mystery well let me ask you i know one of the cases in the, of uh, shc that you discussed in your book is that of hmm. mary is it mary reiser or mary riser i'm not sure if i'm saying that's correctly um, and also, can you give me a bit of an overview on the case and your thoughts on it? Yeah, absolutely. So it's 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 her name was Mary Hardy Reesa. Um, she's you know famously known as the Cinder Woman, um, and it's really one of the most famous and fascinating cases um, of SHC or alleged SHC. Um, it occurred back in in 1951. She was a, an elderly woman. She was around 67 years old um, at the time that she died. Um, she came from Columbia, Pennsylvania, uh, but after her, her husband's passing and he was a doctor, she then moved to Florida, St. Petersburg in Florida, in order to be closer to her son. He was also a doctor. Um, and basically, she'd, she'd taken up residence in this small apartment. Um, she'd only been there about five weeks when the incident occurred. Um, and essentially, they, they found her, her remains... Um, she weighed around 170 pounds, and more or less her entire body 
had been reduced to fire and ash. Um, she and had was, like uh, – well, I'm sorry. I, I believe she, – didn't she have like par- partial uh, from her calf down of one or both legs? Yeah, so there was just a the, – the, there was the, the, the left foot um, still clad in its slipper that was remaining. Uh, there was also like a chunk of backbone and her uh, purportedly shrunken skull as well was also there. Uh, she had been seated on a chair as well, an easy chair, which was also reduced to ash, of course, except the you know the metal components, the springs and that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, it was a very, very dramatic case. There is that the, – the photograph that you mentioned before is a, is a famous photograph. It's basically – it was taken in the apartment – um, after her, her remains had been discovered, and you can see a couple of men, uh, you know, firefighters, basically scooping up her her ashes, um, you know, and uh, sort of cleaning up the scene and that sort of thing. So that's what that that photograph is. It's grisly. Um, yeah, it certainly is. Um, so it's you know it's a famous image, and um, the weird thing, of course, is as I said, the nearby objects uh, in these cases can be more or less untouched, and that was the case with, with Mrs. Risa. Um, so there was, you know, like paint on, on the walls was neither, you know, cracked nor singed. There was a pile of newspaper, uh, newspaper, sorry, located just within la- arm, sorry, arm's length of where the, the easy chair had sat, and that was not even scorched. Um, and also sheets on a, on a bed just a few feet away were completely unmarked. Um, the ceilings and walls were uh, smoke-blackened, uh, and covered in like a moist soot um, and everything it was basically just sort of four feet above the ground uh, everything was more or less unaffected um, so that's where the the you know the soot and so on started it was just sort of four feet above the ground which itself was I suppose a little bit strange as well um, <clears throat> but yeah there'd, there'd been a couple of people who had seen her the the night before that was her uh, the landlady Pansy Carpenter and also her son, uh, Richard Jr. Uh, Pansy Carpenter had heard a sort of a strange noise that night, or sorry, early on the morning of uh, the 2nd of July. It was like a dull thud. Um, but basically she was the one who discovered uh, Mrs. Reese's remains. She went to check on her in the morning because, you know, the lady hadn't been seen around, which was quite odd. She was sort of an early riser and that sort of thing. Uh, and she went to... because. Uh, a telegram uh, had been delivered, so she went to take the telegram to Mrs. Reese's apartment, uh, and she touched the screen door, and it was actually hot to the touch. And then she, you know, smelt smoke, and she noticed that there was, you know, soot on the walls of the hallway and so on, and that's when she, of course, alerted the uh, the police and firefighters and so on, and, and they, of course, investigated the case. Uh, they did quite a thorough investigation as well. Uh, it was their conclusion that... Um, that basically she'd fell, fallen asleep in her chair, that she'd been smoking because uh, right. she was a smoker, that she'd um, – she also did take mild sedatives of an evening as well. So they believed that she basically kind of passed out in her chair. She dropped the cigarette, and then the chair had gone up in flames. Well, I, well, I'll um, tell you, being, being a son of a, a mother and father had both smoked, you know, I, mm. I mean, I, I saw plenty of times my, my pop after, you know, having a pint – fall asleep in the easy chair and go, oh, bloody, you know, whatever, throw the cigarette off mm. to the side, you know, the, the when it burnt down yep. his fingers. But I've never seen anybody catch on fire and burn to death. And if they were to burn, it would have burnt the, the couch and everything around it. And, you know, so yep. that, that doesn't really fly here, does it? No, it, it is very, very difficult to, you know, to, to catch fire to, a um, you know, an item of furniture such as a chair using – you know, just a just a cigarette, for example. Um, you know, I mean, I don't know if you've ever um, had to dispose of a of, of a chair that way, but normally, you, you know, you really have to douse it with with gasoline or something like that in order to get it to burn. So, right. it is very strange. Um, and of course, you know, we're we're talking about a, a great deal of heat here as well in order to reduce her body to that state. You know, where it's almost completely gone and it's been, you know, just a just a fine powder really remaining of course apart from a, a few parts of her body of course the, the, the left foot being one um, but there was a, a anthropologist um, Dr. Wilton Krogman um, and he was happened to be vacationing uh, near St. Petersburg at the time that the incident occurred so he heard, heard about it in the papers and so on he was intrigued by it he was contacted by the police to 
sort of, you know, give his opinion and offer his expertise on the case. Um, and he'd done all sorts of experiments uh, over the years on, you know, what happens to the human body when it's exposed to fire. So he was basically a world leading expert on this topic. Um, and he, of course, had, had, had sort of worked for the police before in, in other cases. Um, and uh, and he was completely baffled. He, he said that uh, he'd ne never heard of anything like it. Um, and there's an interesting quote here that I'd like to, to just read out to you. Um, so, of course, he believed that, um, you know, in order to reduce her body to that state, it would have required a tremendous amount of heat. And he said, um, I've been present at tests of body and bone reaction to extreme heat. And it's been established that heat of about 3000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is around 1600 degrees Celsius, is necessary to completely consume the bones, as happened in the Risa case. I cannot conceive of such complete cremation without more burning of the apartment itself. So that's really the key thing here, the fact that, that this uh, fire was so localised. Um, it was just really very specific to to her and the chair, and it didn't spread. Um, and as I said, we would have, you know, would have required a tremendous amount of heat. Why didn't it then spread and burn down the apartment? And this is something that we find in, in many cases of SHC or alleged SHC. Lewis, let me ask you this. Uh, I know you explore the notion that SHC might mm. be some form of subconscious suicide. Can you please explain that? Yeah, absolutely. So this is, I think this is one of the more, um, uh, you know, compelling cases uh, for SHC. Uh, there are so many different theories, of course. Um, but I think, uh, you know, because I, I have an interest in psychology and so on, I, I think it's always good to to try and look at the, you know, the state of mind of the person, the victim. Um, and we find that, you know, for example, in, in poltergeistry, because there, there is a link there between poltergeistry and SHC, which we'll get to in just a moment, we find that in poltergeistry, generally the activity, the, the psychokinetic activity, which can involve, you know, objects being thrown around and uh, rapping sounds on the walls and that sort of thing, um, it's generally linked to a person in the house. Of course, these cases generally occur within a sort of domestic environment, within a family. And generally there's a lot of tension uh, within that family, a lot of unhappiness, and the activity occurs around you know, what is really the most sort of troubled member of the family. It's generally like an adolescent uh, and they're, you know, undergoing puberty. Uh, so generally a troubled adolescent and they're referred to as the focus uh, of the activity or the agent, the poltergeist agent. Um, and the, the leading theory says that, it, uh, you know, poltergeistry is um, recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis. So it originates from the subconscious of the agent. Um, and the, there's a fascinating theory that, um, and it's one that Vincent Gaddis discusses in quite some detail in his book, um, Mysterious Fires and Lights. He talks about this. So this is really where I, I got the idea from. Um, so he basically said that uh, in the case of poltergeistry, the, the energy is externalized. So it's directed at objects in the environment, in the external environment. But in the case of uh, SHC, he, the energy is internalized. Um, and he believed that it was basically triggered by a subconscious desire to die, to commit suicide. Uh, and we do find that in the case of Mary Hardy Reese, she was very depressed in the, the weeks leading up to her death. And that's partly because she was trying to, you know, find an apartment in Colombia. She wanted to stay there for a little while. Um, she really didn't enjoy living in, in St. Petersburg in Florida. She, she really didn't like the climate. She couldn't handle the heat and humidity. So she was very upset um, just before this happened. Um, so this theory suggests that, um, that yeah, it's, it's caused by a subconscious desire to die, and it's, it's triggered um, or it's, it's sort of caused by a malfunction within the body's electrical system because, because of course, we do have, um, you know, the – all of our thoughts and, and movements and so on are caused by electrochemical activity, you know, in, in, in the, in, in the uh, caused by, you know, nerve impulses as, as, as they're referred to. So, mm -hmm. so I, I think that's where the, the energy would come from. It would come from the body's electrical system. So really this theory states that, um, you know, SHC is triggered by negative suicidal thoughts 
um, you know, which then uh, causes a malfunction within the body's electrical system and the person basically just sort of literally bursts into flames and, you know, and, and as, as we see in, in the case of Mary Hardy Risa, for example. So, so I think that's the strongest theory. Um, I'm not saying that it's, it's it's necessarily the cause of SHC, but I think it's probably one of the more the stronger, more believable theories. Everybody, this is uh, Lewis Proud. You are listening to us on the Paranormal UK radio station and all over, <laughs> all over the different formats. And we are talking about spontaneous, spontaneous human combustion. Um, right now, I was going to ask you a little bit more about poltergeist. Now, according to the spirit theory, poltergeists are exactly mm. that. You know, they're the spirits of the dead. Now, what is your take yeah. on this theory? Yeah, right. Well, it's – I think it's um, it's certainly a theory that's that's worth exploring. Um, and I mean that the, the term itself, uh, poltergeist, of course, is German for, for, you know, noisy ghost or noisy spirit. So that's really, you know, I suppose historically what a what a poltergeist is. Of course, it's also, uh, you know, they also believe too that the, the poltergeist uh, activity was caused by, you know, demons, witches, fairies, and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so other entities, other other beings, if you like. Um, and I know too that that uh, you know, for example, Colin Wilson, he was a, a famous British uh, author, and he he wrote some really fascinating books on on paranormal phenomena. He subscribed to the theor- spirit theory. Um, so did Guy Lyon Playfair as well, another another British man uh, who I believe he died just a couple of years ago. Um, he wrote some really fascinating books on the paranormal. Um, so they both believed in the spirit theory. Um, and, um, you know, even though... Well, I suppose really the issue is that it's the reason that so many people reject the spirit theory is because it's, I'd say it's sort of a, an unpopular um, thing to believe in, uh, you know, to admit that you believe in spirits is, is, is it's not a very po- sort of popular position to take. Um, and I, I do lean more towards the, um, the idea that these things are caused by the subconscious mind. Uh, but I don't discount or sorry, discount the possibility that there may be, you know, other entities involved and that sort of thing. Uh, because we do find that in, in cases of poltergeistry that the sometimes the alleged entity will behave in a very independent manner. So it seems to have a sort of will and intelligence of its own that seems to be very much separate from anyone living in the house, uh, any living person. So I think that, you know, it may be in some cases there is some kind of external agency involved. Well, uh, it's hard you know, to say. Well, you know, I mean, it's especially now with such a resurgence of interest in the paranormal and things like that. And um, just mm. like the late 1800s, early 1900s spiritualist movement, uh, everything goes yep. in cycles. You know, what's the old saying? There's nothing new under the sun. Um, you know, we had yep. mentioned a little bit off air about stuff like, you know, the infield haunting and, and different famous cases. Um, what is the great uh, Amherst mystery, and why, in your opinion, is it such a significant case? Yeah, so I, I discussed this case in, in, in quite some detail in the book. It's a, a famous poltergeist case that occurred, um, first started in 1878. Um, it happened in Amherst, Nova Scotia in Canada, and the activity occurred around a 19-year-old woman uh, named Esther Cox. Um, the case gets its name from a book that was written by a gentleman named Walter Hubble. He was a, an actor with an interest in the paranormal, um, and he was at first very sceptical of the case, uh, but he then went to investigate it. He basically wanted to defraud uh, the mystery uh, because he'd earlier investigated spiritualism, and he saw evidence of you know many fraudulent mediums and that sort of thing. So... Uh, he became very sceptical after investigating uh, spiritualism. So he went and stayed with the family. They lived in like a, a, a cramped cottage. Uh, it was an extended family, quite a large family. Um, it was, I suppose, not a particularly happy sort of family environment. Um, although, then again, it wasn't a particularly bad uh, environment either. But Esther was sort of the the black sheep among her siblings. Um she was uh, 
believed to be a little bit jealous of her older, more attractive and popular sister, Jenny. Uh, but basically, the, the activity started, it was one night while she was lying in bed, Esther was lying in bed with, uh, uh, with Jenny, they shared a bed together, uh, and she complained of there being a mouse under the covers, so there seemed to be a small creature under the covers, and she was very startled by this. Um, and then the, the activity sort of escalated um, over the following few nights. Uh, and she also had uh, – she complained of having like a fever. So she – basically her, her body swelled up, um, and there was some strange poltergeist-type effects associated with that as well. She just sort of developed this fever all of a sudden. So she seemed to get quite sick. And then that sort of disappeared very quickly. Um, and then they started to hear, you know, like rapping sounds on the walls and that sort of thing. And we find this in poltergeist cases where they'll, you know, just sudden, you know, it'll happen just all of a sudden. There'll be just one very odd incident one night, and then it, it, it intensifies and it gets stronger and stronger. Um, and um, and they actually started to communicate with this alleged entity using a sort of a code of one rap for yes, two raps for no. So they were returning the raps uh, from this entity, uh, but uh, it, it became quite sort of malicious in nature, the activity, um, and they also were hearing like, um, you know, really loud noises on the, the cottage as well, which seemed to be like a, you know, someone striking the cottage repeatedly with a sledgehammer. Wow. Um, and there was also um, one night too. They, there was a, a message was found scrawled on the wall. It said, "Esther Cox, you are mine to kill." Uh, and that's a very famous oh aspect of the case. <laughs> well, it, <laughs> so, mm. I, you know, I was going to say this. This is. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with some of the American cases and whatnot, but there was a an area not too far yep. from me in here in Western Kentucky uh, called the Bell Witch. And yeah. it was kind of a famous, you know, uh, similarly famous uh, poltergeist type activity. And again, it, in that same sort of style, little things would start happening, rapping, scratching. Uh, people would have, you know, the girls would have their hair pulled. There would be one that they seem to favor, the other ones they seem not to. And, um, yeah. and you know, even in movies, modern movies like by Stephen King, like Carrie, it seems like there's energy around a certain person. And mm. uh, sometimes it's directed toward them or through them or away from them, yeah. the people maybe they dislike or whatever. Um, it's very strange. I mean, you know, you do hear a lot of about, about uh, people going through puberty, you know, which it just seems like it's mainly uh, mainly female. I've, I've, I've not heard a whole yeah. lot that's centered around teenage boys. I've heard of possessions mm. and things, but not uh, yeah. so much poltergeist activity. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm really not sure, but but certainly you're right. It does seem to happen in particular around, um, you know, yeah, young women. Um, you know, certainly when they're they're undergoing puberty. Um, you know, I mean, there's there's a theory, of course, that it's 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 partly related to, um, you know, maybe uh, repressed sexual feelings and and, and that sort of thing. Uh, maybe girls, I suppose, uh, feel more pressured to to sort of keep those types of feelings bottled up. I'm not too sure. But um, in the case of Esther Cox, um, I suppose the really scary thing was the fact that it was – the activity really seemed to target her in a very kind of malicious kind of way. Um, and, and, you know, it was really tormenting the family. And they um, – it also threatened to, to burn down the cottage as well. And, and there were cases where – these fires would just suddenly erupt in, in various parts of the cottage and they had to race around and try and put out the flames as quickly as they could. Um, so there was a really a real fear among the family members that the, the place would burn to the ground, essentially. Um, and Walter Hubble, he, he, of course, as I said, he was staying with the family. He witnessed a lot of these events firsthand. Um, and he, he knew, of course, that the activity was connected to Esther. Uh, and he observed that the activity seemed to vary in intensity in accordance with a 28-day a cycle. Um, and, uh, you know, that really seemed to relate to her, perhaps her menstrual cycle. So exactly. there's another sort of, you know, sexual component there. But the really significant thing is the fact that um, just days before the outbreak occurred, Esther had had this really um, terrifying uh well, tremendous. She'd suffered a tremendous shock. She'd been um, dating this young man um, named Bob McNeil. Uh, he was kind of, I suppose, a, sort of a typical kind of bad boy. 
Um, and uh, they'd been going for like a, uh, you know, like a like a, a ride in a carriage, and and he'd then stopped the carriage and he'd uh, he took out a gun and he he basically, you know, threatened to 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 you know to rape her, and uh, uh, so she was terrified by this incident. Um, <clears throat> and um, as I said, it was just a few days later that the activity occurred. So, you know, possibly there were some, um, you know, I suppose, um, you know, sexual uh, feelings on her part. I'm, I'm not too sure, obviously, but um, but in any case, uh, it had caused a tremendous psychological shock. Um, and then this this dramatic uh, outbreak occurred. So once again, another sort of sexual component there. Um, and I also, of course, find the case really interesting because of the, the, the spontaneous fires, because that, of course, ties into to SHC as well. Well, that was something I was going to ask you next. Now, in your mm. book, you detail several cases in which the poltergeists yep. have seemingly caused fires to just erupt spontaneously. What can yep. you tell us about the phenomenon? What's, what is the thing that's triggering that in your, in your view? Yeah, right. Well, there's there's quite a few of these cases, um, you know, poltergeist cases that feature, you know, essentially spontaneous outbreaks of fire, um, and of course the the Great Amherst Mystery is is is, is one of those cases. There was another one uh, that occurred in 1932 in in Bladenboro in North Carolina, another famous case. It occurred in the home belonging to a man named uh, Council H. Williamson and his wife Lydia. Basically, just over a three-day period, there were some 20 fires that uh, erupted in various parts of the house. Um, the fires seemed to target specific objects, um, in particular like uh, window shades and curtains and you know bedclothes and stacks of paper and that sort of thing. Uh, and there was also an incident, too, where um, Williamson's daughter, uh, other accounts say it was his wife, she was wearing a dress that suddenly caught fire. Uh, she'd just been sort of standing there, and all of a sudden, the you know the dress just erupted into flames. They had to tear the garment off her. Uh, the strange thing is that she didn't actually suffer any burns to her body, uh, and we also find that in some of these cases as well, the the fires actually don't seem to really cause any any burning of people or you know any sort of uh, injury of that kind. Um, so these 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 fires were very uh, specific in, in in the things that they targeted, um, and also the flames were described as uh, bluish in colour, um, so like similar to those from a gas jet, and we also of course find that in SHC as well. There have been cases where people have observed the phenomenon erupt and the flames seem to be bluish in colour. Um, and uh, the fires, of course, didn't didn't spread as fires normally do. They were very localized, um, and also smokeless as well. That was another thing that was observed. The fires didn't seem to emit any smoke, uh, and these are all things that we find in SHC as well. So there definitely seems to be a, an overlap there between poltergeist cases that feature outbreaks of fire and spontaneous human combustion. Well, you know, if, um, if obviously, I'm sure there's a lot of listeners who might be uh, might be welders or whatever, uh, or the, yeah. perhaps they've been in science class, and obviously, and you know, you learn about mm. different stars. You know, uh, you know, red stars aren't as hot as say orange stars, and it goes on up into a bright whitish blue, you know, flame. Just like if you have a cutting tor- a cutting torch uh, to cut yeah. through something, it's going to be. Like you said, bluish, bluish white. So that's that's mm. incredible. That's incredible heat coming out of that person's mm. body. Yeah, and um, but yeah, they, these fires seem to have very, very peculiar properties. Um, and uh, I suppose that the very localized aspect of the fires is, is an intriguing thing. Uh, I think, in particular, there was a a great book written by Guy Lowe and Playfair called The Flying Cow. I don't know if you've read that one. Uh, but it was about some of the poltergeist cases that he and other paranormal events that he um, investigated in, in Brazil because he, he spent quite a few years over there. Uh, there was one case that he talks about that happened in 1970 in, in Sao Paulo uh, where there was a poltergeist outbreak was in a family uh, where there were fires and it was investigated by the police and um, there was an incident where there was a, a mattress. Uh, it started to burn. Um, and the 
one police officer actually cut open the mattress and he found that it literally was burning from the inside out. Um, and there was basically like the, the, the cotton stuffing was, was glowing hot like coals, yet there was no actual flame present. Um, so that's a really, really interesting thing. Of course, in SHC, we find that um, the person seems to burn from within. The, the fire seems to originate from within the body. And in this case, we find that the fire originated from within that mattress. Um, so that's that's very very interesting. Um, the other thing too is, and this probably this is probably going off on a little bit of a tangent, but tangent. Sorry. Um, in the, uh, the 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 Jin tradition, uh, which of course is a is a is a Islamic, Arabic Islamic belief, they believe in these um, uh, you know paranormal entities called Jin. Right. Uh, and they believe that basically all sort of paranormal uh, manifestations are caused by you know troublesome Jin. Uh, in particular, poltergeist events. Um, and, uh, you know, you find in the Quran, for example, it talks about the jinn being these beings that were created by God from smokeless fire. And what that seems to be alluding to is the fourth state of matter, which is called plasma, um, which basically is a, a kind of smokeless fire. Um, and it's basically an ionized gas. So... I think that's very interesting, and we find too, of course, that plasma is, is typically blue. Um, so there could be some some relationship there between, um, you know, these these things could be due to some sort of form of plasma or something like that. It's very hard to say, um, but certainly we don't seem to be dealing with a, a normal form of fire. Um, we seem to be dealing with something that that operates according to very different uh, laws, I suppose. Um, yeah. So these fires are, are deeply mysterious. Well, it does seem that uh, it, it it is something uh, you could almost say it's unearthly and sort mm. of uh, supersedes what we know in regards of our our laws and uh, and mathematics and all yep. that. Let me ask you this: mm. I know in the third and final section of your book, now it deals with yep. anomalous lights. Now, my anomalous lights. Now, are you referring to UFOs or are you you're referring to something transdimensional? What what would this be? <laughs> Yeah, right. So I, I should just start off by explaining that I, I, I don't subscribe to the extraterrestrial hypothesis, which is the theory that you know UFOs are caused by um, basically nuts and bolts, alien craft, uh, craft that originate, say, from a distant planet or a distant part of the universe, um, and that's really sort of the leading or most popular theory to explain UFO activity. Um, and I think maybe, you know, maybe we could be dealing with some cases where extraterrestrial beings have visited mankind. I'm not too sure, but I think um, we're dealing with something instead that's really connected to the Earth. Um, so I use the term anomalous lights to refer to um, a whole range of inexplicable things, um, such as... Uh, you know, ball lightning, earth lights, earthquake lights, etc., and also orbs as well, which, um, you know, occasionally manifest during poltergeist incidents and that sort of thing. So these are all incidents where there's some form of luminosity present. Um, and these lights, of course, um, as I said, we're dealing with a whole range of different things, but these are things that that seem to be more or less produced by the earth, that seem to have a more or less a natural origin uh, but nonetheless have some very, very peculiar and strange properties. Um, so, for example, in the case of ball lightning, which uh, these, you know, small balls of light, generally about the size of a grapefruit, um, and they, you know, seem to be composed of plasma. Once again, there's that plasmatic connection. Um, they typically occur during thunderstorm activity. Um, certainly after there's been like a, a, a lightning strike to the ground, that's generally when these things manifest, and they're very, very peculiar. Um, and I should also point out that uh, ball lightning wasn't really accepted by the scientific establishment until the late 1960s. They were very, very skeptical um, of these reports because ball lightning has such peculiar properties, and it seems to really, I suppose, in, in a sense, sort of contradict the known laws of physics. Um, so these strange luminous spheres, they manifest, as I said, in connection with, uh, you know, lightning strikes or thunderstorm activity. They can be, um, they can occur in all sorts of different colors, like red, orange, yellow, etc. Sometimes they are seen, you know, 
clearly in daylight as well, and there doesn't seem to be any thunderstorm activity present. Um, they generally um, they generally explode after a very brief period of time, or they just disappear. Um, so they're not around for very long as well. So people only see these things for around five to ten seconds. Sometimes they emit a, a you know, like a distinct odor, which is similar to it's been described as like ozone, burning sulfur. Sometimes they emit like a hissing sound. Uh, but ball lightning can do all sorts of really weird things. It's uh, been observed to pass through walls, uh, pass through ceilings, and leave holes in panes of glass, uh, materialize inside aircraft. And also there have been reports of ball lightning basically changing shape and then you know squeezing through a keyhole in order to enter a room, for example. And we find a lot of quite a few cases of this from all over the world. Well, not just. Um, so all that, well, I was just going to say, not not even just through, throughout the world uh, in UFO cases. I mean, think of yeah. um, the the story of Pinocchio. Do you remember when the uh, the uh, the fairy come through and, and went and checked on Pinocchio, and he and it come through yeah. the uh, through the keyhole, and there it was, and it glue into the room. And and there's so many different mm. stories of uh, sprites and yeah. elves and fairies uh, doing mm. the same sort of thing. You know, so you know maybe yeah. that's the way that they try to explain this phenomenon by putting some sort of uh, face and name on it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, certainly there's a connection there between these anomalous lights, um, you know, including, of course, ball lightning and, um, you know, uh, you know, sort of fairy activity and, 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 and that and also, you know, spirit activity and that sort of thing. So historically, um, you know, that's that's really how they sort of um, explain these 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 weird um, occurrences. Um, so. So it's very bizarre, and also um, another significant thing I wanted to mention is uh, the Foo Fighter phenomenon, um, because these you know strange balls of light that these uh, pilots saw during World War II uh, were described in very similar terms to ball lightning, although in this case the objects seemed to have a definite kind of intelligence, uh, and they were very sort of inquisitive, playful objects that these pilots saw. Uh, you know, they would basically um, sort of circle their aircraft and, you know, shoot off into the distance and they would try to pursue the objects and they wouldn't be able to catch them. So they're able to, they were unable to, you know, outmaneuver these objects. Um, so these strange balls of light, um, I, I think there's a definite crossover there too between uh, ball lightning and and uh, the Foo Fighter phenomenon. We could be dealing with a, because um, it, when we talk, when we use that label ball lightning, we could be referring to a range of, of different things that have uh, a range of different, um, you know, mechanisms of production as well. There could be different different types of ball lightning, if you like. Um, and there's a theory that in the case of the Foo Fighters, um, it was uh, a, a basically an intelligent high altitude form of ball lightning. Um, so there are many, many cases there that suggest that that these objects may have some kind of, you know, sentience or intelligence as well. You know, sometimes they'll come into a room and they'll sort of very carefully explore the room and then, you know, exit via the win window or the chimney or something like that. So uh, it's it's very baffling. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, we probably got probably about seven or eight minutes left. Yeah. Now, is there any hard evidence to support the theory that ball lightning is responsible for at least some incidences of spontaneous human combustion? Um, I, th I think there is. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a fascinating theory. So, it, it, and it's a theory that's been discussed, um, you know, really ever since ball lightning was accepted as a, as a genuine scientific phenomenon. Um, you know, people have speculated that it may be the cause of SHC. Um, we do know that, of course, uh, you know, ball lightning, as with linear or conventional lightning, it can cause injury and death. There have been people who have been, uh, you know, struck by ball lightning and, and, and have died. Of course, there was a famous physicist, uh, George William Reichman, back in 1753, who was, was killed as a result of being struck by ball lightning. Um, so we know that the, the ball lightning can be very very damaging it can you know burn objects um it can char flesh etc 
Uh, generally speaking, though, there's there's little heat associated with the objects. But as I said, we could be dealing with a range of different things that have different properties when we use that term ball lightning. Um, but I, I've, I uncovered, um, you know, a fair few cases that suggest some kind of link between the two. Um, there was a famous case that was reported back in Fate magazine back in 1961. Um it was a case that was reported by an American reverend named Winner Jean Savage. Oh, yeah. Uh, and he said that the, the brother of one of his friends was aw awoken around 5 a.m. He heard his wife screaming. Uh, he followed her screams to the living room, and then he saw her basically lying on a floor on the rug. She was burning fiercely, and there was a, a blazing ball of light uh, just hovering above her. Uh, and they tried to put out the flames, uh, they managed to, of course, but the burns were so severe that she later died in hospital. Um, and, of course, we find, too, that in this case there was little damage to surrounding objects, uh, just apart from the rug that was beneath her, um, caused by those flames. So that, that sort of indicates that there may have been some form of ball lightning involved. Um, I think the most uh, compelling case was one from 1978. Uh, there were five mountaineers. They were... Um, Russian mountaineers. They were uh, basically camping in the Caucasus Mountains in Russia, and uh, it was a quite high up. Of course, it was around three thousand nine hundred meters, um, and they claimed that this strange object. It was like a uh, a yellow blob, as they described it. It actually entered their tent, uh, and then it very deliberately and methodically dived into their sleeping bags. Um, and they were uh, – apparently it, it caused really severe burns to their body, so they were basically screaming in agony. Uh, one of the men talked about passing out repeatedly from the, the pain and the, you know, the shock of the experience. Uh, they were later taken to hospital, um, and apparently the burns were so bad that there were basically chunks of muscle – torn straight from their bones as well oh my God. Um, they they received medical treatment but one of the men uh, sadly died in hospital um, so there's an incident there that seems to suggest some kind of connection as well there's also a famous case of uh, Jacqueline Fitzsimon this is a, a case of SHC that was reported in uh, 1985 she was a, uh, a high school student 17 years old and basically she was just standing there you know, accompanied by some of her friends when her clothes just suddenly caught fire. Um, she'd been standing there in the stairwell. She had just come out of cooking class. Uh, and it's, you know, the theory is that, uh, I suppose the orthodox explanation is that her clothes must have caught fire. Um, you know, maybe there was a, a little bit of, um, you know, like she'd been standing there at a, at a gas cooking ring or something like that, and it had caused her clothes to smolder or something like that. And then the draft in the stairwell had caused her her clothes to just sort of go up in flames. But it's very hard to, um, you know, there's holes with that theory because um, her friends who witnessed this, they said it was just a very instant, uh, very violent um, process you know she just suddenly uh, burst into flames as she was standing there um, and, um, and and they actually did tests too on her clothes and they found that her clothes weren't particularly flammable either uh, but she suffered burns to around 80% of her body uh, and she later died in hospital from pneumonia um, but the really weird thing is that one of her uh, one of the girls uh, who witnessed this she talked about seeing a um, like a ball of light um, basically just sort of appear above her and then drop down into her clothing just moments before the flames erupted. Um, so that could have been some kind of, of, of form of ball lightning. Certainly it was some kind of anomalous light um, or maybe some kind of plasmatic manifestation or something of that nature. So that's very strange. Um, and the other weird thing too is the Mary Reesa case. Um, there's a, a story connected to that where... Um, Basically, the police received this uh, unmarked letter, unsigned letter in the mail, uh, and it said, a, and I quote, uh, a ball of light came through the open window and hit her. I seen it happen. So it was a <laughs> wow. very poorly written note, but it was, um, it was you know, to maybe the, the person did that. Exactly. Maybe right. that was to conceal their identity, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because they were 
there was some speculation at the time that it might have meant she might have died as a result of foul play. So maybe uh, they didn't want to be implicated sure. in that incident. So, you know, so yeah. maybe they did actually see something into her into her house and, and, and cause that incident to occur. So, Perhaps you so. know, I think um, I think it's a fascinating theory. It needs to be further explored and further studied. It sounds awesome. Hey, Lewis, uh, in the last two minutes that we've got, what can we expect from you in Volume 2 of Borderland Phenomena? Yeah, right. So I'm, I'm just currently working on uh, Volume 2. It's uh, just sort of doing research at this stage. Um, and I'm going to be looking into... Uh, mysterious disappearances and that sort of thing. It's going to be a sort of a continuation um, from volume one, um, and it's going to explore things a little bit deeper and also kind of look at the the idea that we live in a multiverse as well. So I want to explore all of those ideas. Um, so that's very exciting. That's um, that's in the works at the moment. That's awesome. You know, and it's it's so funny that um, th- just the fact that. For so long, I mean, it, because you know, ball lightning and things like that it, uh, mm. have been reported for ever. And you know, the thing yeah. is, the way you describe some of the things, it almost struck me as almost an elemental, uh, obviously a sentient, dr- yeah. driven, conscious actions. You know, it wasn't mm. just a happenstance. You know, so who knows? Yeah. You might you might explore uh, the possibilities of you know elementals. On whatever yep. whatever sort of a level, having some control of it, or maybe having some, I don't know, yep. some connection. Maybe it's a it's sort of like you know you have mm. you have apes, you have orangutans, and maybe it's a different type of lightning or a different type of uh, energy signature like that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, certainly historically, um, you know, a lot of these certainly in European countries and that sort of thing, these uh, types of events where people would see strange balls of light and that sort of thing. Um, you know, they were really sort of connected to, uh, you know, earth spirits and, you know, elemental beings, fairies, uh, gnomes and, and, and that sort of thing. So that was that that was their interpretation of it. Um, and there's, of course, a, a great book by um, Jacques Vallée, uh, Passport to Magonia, where he looks in, he explores the connection between, you know, UFO activity uh, and fairy law. Uh, which I think is a very interesting perspective on the phenomenon. So it seems as though this phenomenon has been with humanity for a very long time, uh, but our sort of you know, our way of perceiving it uh, or our thoughts on it, uh, our perspective on it has kind of shifted and morphed, uh, you know, over the years. So it's very much, um, I, I suppose, certainly in this day and age, a lot of people want to believe in extraterrestrials. So that's kind of the the spin that people put on it. Right. Um, well, and but, you know, made... historically it was very different. Mm. Right. And, you know, it's one of those things. Uh, there's three sides to a, to a conversation, their side, yep. you know, your side, and the truth. So some, maybe it falls somewhere in between that. But, Lewis, exactly. we're, we're, we're coming to the end of the hour. I, I, you know, it's just the time that we've got. And I would love to have you back on. And if uh, you'll stick around long enough for my outro, I'd love to talk to you. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Well, thanks. All right, everybody, please make sure to go check out Lewis Proud's book, Borderland Phenomena, Volume 1, Spontaneous Combustion, Portageistry, and Anomalous Lights. And this is available on Amazon. But I want you guys to go out and enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the sunshine. But as the sun sets and the shadows grow long, make sure to check under your bed, check in your closet, check down that back hallway. You never know what may be there. Maybe it's a ball of light that's come for you. But... You know, sometimes in fear there's knowledge and there's nothing wrong with learning. And, you know, sometimes that's what's going to happen. You know, that's the nature of uh, life and death. You come through this and hopefully you get through it by learning to love one another and love yourselves. And until next time, everybody, I want you to have a great day. Please make sure to check out Lewis Proud's blog and keep in touch. And I hope to see you guys back again. And until next time, everybody at Paranormal. Uh, Paranormal UK Radio my Stevie Asher page and everybody that's at my House of Asher page on YouTube, take care be well and God bless